Hello and welcome to the Haskin Cast podcast. It is episode 133, part two of our Uriah Heap doubleheader week. And I am very excited to bring you our guest, bass player Paul Newton, who was the bass player for Spice and then stayed into Uriah Heap and worked with Ken Hensley prior to that. So it's interesting, of course, that uh, I got to interview them uh, a day apart from each other. And uh, wow, what a, what a guy and what a bass player. When I listen back to some of these pieces that he, he wrote and played on, uh, really some jazzy and some grooving bass lines, some stuff that, that he just knows where to, to place the notes and where not to place the notes. And that's just as important. Uh, you'll hear it when you listen to him play on anything that he's done. Uh, just a phenomenal talent and a hell of a guy, as I as I came to find out. This was the first chance that I'd had to meet Paul. Uh, really great guy. And, uh, you know, I, I could babble on about what's going on in my life, and uh, that would be fine. But uh, I'm not going to do it, because just like our, our interview with Ken Hensley, I'm so excited to bring you this interview that I'm just going to go right to it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am very excited to bring you a fabulous guest, a very talented bass player and songwriter from uh, very well known from Uriah Heap days, the bass player uh, from the uh, original band. And uh, moving forward, he's done some other great work that we're going to talk about. Paul Newton. Paul, how are you? Yeah, I'm cold. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I'm all good. How are things in London these days? I imagine uh, probably just as frustrating as well. I don't city. actually live in London anymore. I live in the southwest of England hmm. in a fairly kind of rural area. So we've been fairly safe here, but obviously we've been affected by by the virus, which is just um, well, it's just awful. Um, none of us can work, do any gigs and whatever. But hey, you know, I'm still alive, so. Um, I'm very lucky. and There's lots of people not as lucky as me. You know? yeah. I think that's the thing is we, we kind of look at, uh, as humans, we kind of tend to look at the things that we don't have and can't do and focus on that. But I think we've, in general, just kind of lost our gratitude that the fact that we are still here to not be able to do those things. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I sometimes get a bit fed up, but I look around and I think, well, hang on. You know, I, I'm kind of better off than many other people. I haven't been affected by the virus yet, yet fingers crossed. Um, I hope that remains the same, but I do, my heart goes out to anybody who's got, who's been affected or anybody who's got somebody in the family that's been affected because it's just awful, yeah. you know? It really is. And I'm just hoping that uh, we're going to find some solution to this. I've just heard that uh, France has gone back on lockdown. And that's a that's a pretty big statement to just lock France down. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I kind of see where everybody's going. But until my thoughts are, until we get an effective and proven vaccine, this is not going to go away. And so we we just have to learn to live with it. It's another risk, as is smoking, driving your car, drinking alcohol, whatever. Um, I think we need to take a step back and, and, and just think, well, hang on. We cannot lock down places forever. It's not going away. We, we, we need to keep the world going because if we keep locking everywhere down, there'll be nothing left to come, come back to. But that's just my kind of feel on it. Well, I think that's the biggest fear is what's going to be left when this is all over. I mean, so many musicians, yeah. they can't perform. And you guys make your money from performances more so than records. Yeah, sales. I mean, it's the, the effect on myself and the other guys in, in the current heat band. None of us, I mean, I've done two shows in the, in the whole of this year. So the effect on my finances is massive. Mm -hmm. And very little government help because I'm an old guy now. I get a state pension so that everybody says, well, hey, you're okay. But uh, in the UK, you don't earn a good living off a state pension. So I mean, I've done virtually nothing this year, but I'm still alive, you know, right. so I'm grateful. Yeah, well, the thing is, I think we all just need to be smart and do our part, you know, just do, do what we can to keep ourselves and each other safe. That's really the only thing we can do while we wait it out. Yeah, I mean, I, I've remained optimistic all through this. I mean, I'm 72 now. I've not locked myself in. I've gone out and done things um, where possible. I've taken all sensible precautions, but I'm too old. I could not 
lock myself indoors for, for, for months and months because I probably I may not have that many years left. So I've, I've just me and my my wife we've been careful and gone out and done whatever's feasible and made the best of it. We've been very fortunate in the UK. We had a very good summer, lots of sunshine. We we could go out in the garden. We could do, I've done lots of work in the home. Um, so I, I, I've just, you know, accepted the situation and made the best of it. And I, I think more people should should do that. Yeah, I think that's a great attitude. It's really the best thing that you can do in this situation. If you if you just let it defeat you, the isolation is going to be much more difficult to deal with. Well, I, I think always in life, and especially as the older we get, optimism. Once you lose optimism and hope, you may as well just lie down and die. So. Um, you know, I, I I just enjoy things to the best of my ability. I like that. And I, yeah, and I've kept myself busy doing all sorts of stuff, playing basses, guitars, and whatever. But working in the home, socialising wherever possible, obviously with precautions. But life goes on. That it does. And speaking of playing bass, now I'm a very very amateur bass player. I'm more of a drummer. But I, Same I, with me. <laughs> really? <laughs> I wouldn't think that by your playing. Uh, you know, bass is great because it bridges the gap between the rhythm and the melodic. And one thing that I love about your playing, and some other bass players do this as well, is that you found a way to do that, but also carve a space for yourself in the song where it's appropriate. Like you, you read music very well in knowing when it's okay to play something a little more interesting than, than just the bass line and throw in a couple of accents here and there, or just create a yeah. groove that takes you out on your own? Yeah, well, I think being a bass player, you're part of the rhythm section. So I've never really got involved in all, in all the fancy six-string, five-string stuff. My job is to work with the drummer, hold the whole thing down so the rest of the guys, Mick Box, Ken Hensley, whoever it may be, can go and do their stuff. And... Uh, there are certain times in a song where, yeah, you can you you can throw things in, but you've got to hold it together. So, a kind of simple bass works for me, and then I'll find find an escape route some nights in a song just to say, well, hang on, I can play this. But I think some bass players tend to get far too busy and destroy the whole context of the song. But I mean, that's just my take on it. Yeah, I would agree with that. In fact, I often say that about guitar players that, uh, you know, the really flashy guitar players, I think you could take a guy like Mick Box, who understands when he's playing a solo, he can play fast, but he still plays everything within the context of the song. Yeah. Some guitar players I hear, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know how they're finding those notes. No, I mean, I think I've always, when we are like a lot, of, a lot of young musicians talk to me about bass playing, guitar playing, whatever it may be, I always say, it's the notes that you don't play sometimes that can. You've got to know when to just keep it, you know, straight, funky, whatever, and th and then find a gap where you can show what you can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very yeah. true. That's exactly what I what I think. And I, I think though that you can also do good lead-ins. Like if you think of, of a song like Simon the Bullet Freak, you have that little bass run that that leads it from that just heartbeat right into the song. So bass is a really versatile instrument, and I think. You've really found a great niche for it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. I would, you know, I, I, I have lots of conversations and, and stuff with with, with, with with musicians, and I hear people say, "You're, yeah, you know, you're a great player." I said, "No, I'm not a great bass player. I just all I do is play what I feel is right for the song." And other bass players have played all the heap stuff over the years, and we all play differently. But I kind of, yeah, I listen to the, some of the stuff sometimes. I mean, July morning is a good example. July morning, you have to think of the song. I'm not, you don't go out there just to pr promote yourself and say, hey, yeah, this is how clever I am. You have to find the gaps in music just to show you can do a little more than play it straight. But my job as a bass player is to work with the drama and hold it all together. Yeah, and you've you definitely know. worked with some great drummers to build that relationship with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my days with Heap and subsequent bands and whatever, I like to just stand at the back and work with the drummer. 
And um, it was unfortunately in the early days of the heat, we had lots. You just learn to work with the drummer and then he gets fired, so you get somebody else comes in. But, yeah, I mean, you learn to live with that. But I'm not, as a bass player, which is probably why I started playing bass when I changed from guitar to bass, is to be at the back and provide the basics for the rest of the guys to work on. Because if your bass player of drama starts to go off on a tangent, then you lose the whole the whole sort of um, ethos of, of whatever song you're playing. Oh, absolutely. Did you uh, work with the drummers directly, or did you just let that develop during rehearsals? No, no, we we, we, we just worked together, and, and, and you just... You just learned how to how guy drummers work, and, and the drummers through my time with Heat would know how I work. So there'd be certain times of the song you just know what you're both going to do. You just learn to read each other, and and that's part of being a rhythm section. I've never been a front man. I've no, I've never had a big ego. Whatever. I've always loved just playing music, and playing your eye Heat music. It's just always been the biggest buzz ever for me. Well, and I think that's what makes it so great is when you're passionate about what you're playing and it's not just, oh, yeah. God, we got to play this song again. And you really feel it every time you play it. That brings out the best performances. Yeah. But I think it's it's so important for any musician, whether you're the, 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 you're the guitarist, bass, but the song is the most important thing. It's not me or, or anybody else. Once you start going off on a tangent saying, look, you know, see what I can play, you lose the point. There's many opportunities on live shows to show what you're able to do, but the song is the main thing. You have to remember what is is relevant to the song. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I just realized something that, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is kind of ironic, but you played with Lee Kerslake in The Gods, but you never played with Lee Kerslake in Uriah Heap. No, no, it was Lee Kerslake, when myself and Ian Clark, the drama art on Look At Yourself, when we were fired, um, the band had been rehearsing with Lee and Mark Clark. So, ah. yeah, I'd worked with Lee previously. I got Lee the job with the gods, and that's when he got to know Ken. But we never actually worked together in heap. We, we've worked um, over the last 20 years until Lee's unfortunate death. Um, we worked with, with, with Ken um, and John Lawton sometimes in, in, in uh, doing shows uh, as Uriah Heap legends, but I'd never worked with Lee, you know, actually in Uriah Heap, which is you know, a shame, really, because Lee was a great drummer and a great singer. You know, I like to look beyond the just the music that was created and think about all the uh, the things that came together to make something work. and. When you really look at it, you're pretty pivotal in the initial success of your Heat because you suggested Ken Hensley from working with him in The Gods. And, you know, those kind of things, that shaped the band. Yeah, well, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd known Lee not in a band context, but I, I got to know Lee in, in the early 60s because when we were all semi-pro, my father managed all my bands and the early era I heap. Um, and during that time, I got to know Lee because Lee's father um, managed Lee's band at the time. And so my father and, and, and Lee's father uh, did, you know, promoted gigs. So we would occasionally do gigs and, and bump into each other and jam together. And so when Ken and myself uh, reformed the gods, and we were looking for a drummer and a guitarist, Lee was a, was a good choice, you know, because he was a great drummer and a great singer. So that's where it all came from. And then, of course, I left the gods and Greg Lake took over and I went to join Spice. But um, earlier I, he, we used a, a session keyboard player on, on the recording of the first album. Um, when it came to going out to doing gigs as Heap, we needed a permanent keyboard player. So, you know, I suggested Ken. He was ideal choice. You know, he played guitar, sang, and um, played Hammond and, and wrote songs. A, a no-brainer, really. Oh, absolutely. I never had the pleasure of meeting Lee. And uh, it, it, ironically, I had just received uh, the contact information for him and reached out about two hours before I heard that he passed away. 
So the question that I have uh, about him is, I've never heard a bad thing about Lee. Everybody talks about him with such uh, admiration and appreciation. Is that the reality? Was he just always somebody that you just wanted to be around? Yeah, I mean, Lee was always a people person. Lee was very much like Mick Box. He always had time to talk to people, fans. We, we do gigs or whatever it may be. Lee would always talk to people. Lee and I, over, over, over the last 20 years, have spent many nights, you know, sat up late in hotels in Finland or Germany or the States, whatever, you know, drinking and just having fun. And Lee was a people person. But Lee was a great drummer, a great singer, a great songwriter, and just a good guy to be around. I mean, Lee was just a big people person. You know, and that's his legacy, and we'll never forget that. You know, everybody, wherever I went to work with Lee, everybody loved Lee. Oh, that's uh, that's beautiful. I love that. I really wish I had had the chance to meet him, but the timing just uh, was unfortunate. No, no, it's a shame you didn't, because you would have loved Lee. And Lee lived with me forever. You know, I will never forget Lee, because we've had so much fun. Not 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 over the heat days, but subsequently... We've just got together, met up at airports and gone off to do gigs. And we've just had fun from the first moment we met. And then we get up on stage and Lee just, well, he, he, he was just immense on stage. Yeah, I definitely enjoy not just listening to him, but watching him play. He's one of those people that even when he looks serious and he's focused, you could just tell he loved what he was doing. No, no, Lee totally signed up to be, be, be a, being a rock star and uh, it's a shame he, he, he got kind of done over by Ozzy Osbourne and his missus but um, which is something that Lee never totally recovered from which I think was quite disgraceful but that's another story Scott but um, yeah. ev every time me and Lee met up in, in London airports and went off to do gigs and meet up with Ken and the rest of the band it was just fun so Great memories for me. And, and as I say, Lee leaves an immense legacy of being a superb musician and a great person. I, I'm really glad to hear that. That's pretty much what I had hoped and expected that you would say, but it's nice to hear that. Um, your first band, though, before Spice, was uh, was your first major band? Was that Shin? Yeah, I would. Shin was my first band. I mean, I'd, I'd been kind of semi-pro with, like, like all of us young musicians in those days with various bands. Um, and I was looking to take it further. And my father at the time, bless him, Paul Newton Sr., was looking after my affairs. So um, we got this band together. There was a band in my local area called the Soul Agents that had split up. And they had a, a, an incredible keyboard player, a guy called Don Shin, where the band name Shin came from. Um, and so we got together. I mean, uh, and it was just a four-piece band, a bit weird in, in, in the mid-60s. It was keyboards, bass, vocalist and drummer. But we we just um, played groundbreaking music, and it was very pre-ELP, Keith Emerson stuff. And so, uh, yeah, we worked together for a while, but the market wasn't ready for us, I guess. Um, had, had it happened later... Yeah, we'd have done the L ELP thing and maybe become massive. But, you know, this is life, you know. It's just been in the right place at the right time. Um, but no, I mean, I, and, and, and the keyboard player, Don Shin, who I actually, after many years, recently made contact with because he'd worked in Norway for years. I mean, Don Shin basically taught me all the jazz feel of bass playing, which which, which I used in, in, in Spice and then later on Salisbury. So, yeah, very talented man and very grateful for him. It's it's interesting that you say that, and that's a great segue because I was going to ask you about uh, the song Salisbury because there are some jazzy parts in that song. Uh, but the, the, the song, whether it goes from jazz to rock, uh, and then you have the, the woodwind and... and um, uh, what you have uh, woodwind and brass sections coming in. It's just that that song just flows so beautifully, but you've got some incredible parts in that song. Yeah, well, I mean, Salisbury, I mean, we're going back a long time here, but I mean, Salisbury was something that came about. It was a collaboration or a joining up of probably three separate songs. 
Um, uh, we, we, so we got it together and went and recorded it. And then Jerry brought our manager and recording manager at the time, wanted to put the orchestra on it. Um, yeah, and okay, that, that, that's what they do. You know, it, it's, these decisions are made. Uh, I was never quite happy with the orchestra thing because I always thought we played it live and we actually played as a band as it should be. But that's just my take on it. So, um, yeah, I mean, Salisbury, the actual Salisbury Sweet Sweet was a very interesting thing. It didn't really receive great reviews or whatever at the time. Subsequently, over the last 40 years or so, people have suddenly got back into it. But I always say to people, there are two or three recordings, recordings out there of us playing it without the orchestra, oh, which yeah. is where it happens for me. I, I thought the orchestra was just um, overcrowding everything. But again, that's just my feel on it, you know. Sure. Well, and you're obviously you're, you're, you're very close to it as one of the creators of the song. Um, boy, I'd like to hear that. Uh, there are, especially when I'm thinking about the the uh, Mick Box solos that uh, are are in those little chunks there, which I thought was great. Instead of it just being one long solo, I like that it's broken up into little pieces. Um, but I love the groove that you're playing during that. That is just some phenomenal writing and playing right there. Oh, well, it's... it's. I mean, I, over the strange, over the years... Probably the most mail and interest I get from he is, oh, wow, you know, you did on souls. But I'd always say to people, well, I'm a bass player. It is basically a jam in the key of C. I mean, uh, you know, we, we played it live many, many times, and I probably didn't play it the same every night because it is just an improvisation thing. Depending on how you feel on the night, that's how you play it. You know, yeah. Um, I'm a I'm a bass player, that, and that's I had a good grounding in playing jazz feel things, and and with early spice with with, with Mick and Dave Byron, um, a lot of our stuff had a jazz feel. M M Mickey Box played a great sort of Barney Kessel uh, a jazz feel in many songs, so that's where we had our grounding. And don't get me wrong, I'm always overwhelmed when people say. Yeah, you know, I love your bass playing on Salisbury. Um, but that, that doesn't, I'm not trying to de diminish those comments, but it is very kind of basic bass playing. And it's a, the sort of thing that it can work great on one night of the gig and the next night you might have a headache or whatever. And it's, you know, it's not very good. But that's what music's about. If we all went out every night and played perfectly night after night, there would no be no point in doing gigs with this. Right, I could just sit home and listen to the record. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the thing that really grips me about that particular section in the song is that, you know, I, I love mixed solos there, but sometimes when I'm listening to it, I'll I'll just focus in on the bass and that's all I listen to because it's just so, it just carries it so well. And from the first time I heard that song, that was one of the highlights of it for me was that little section right there. Yeah, well, I, I, I think something like Salisbury, and there is another very jazzy thing a little similar to that on, on an album, an early album with all the old spice things, a song called Magic Lantern. But this is where myself and Mick just used to go off and groove into all sorts of fields. And um, we worked together, and with, you know, again, as, as, as I say about working with drummers, we just knew where we were both going. So we both complemented each other. That's, it's a beautiful relationship, and it certainly comes out in, in the writing and in the performance. Um, I wanted to ask you also about one of, another one of my favorite Heap songs that uh, I have credited as you writing it is uh, Dream Mare. Oh, yeah, Dream Mare, yeah. Well, there's, there's, there's a bit of dispute going on a lot of these songs for the first album there, because Mr. Hensley is saying that he actually wrote them, but I don't want to go down that road. Sure. I mean, Dream Mare, it was a song that came about, and I can remember getting this together, I was down at my parents' house late at night and I'd got the riff together and I thought, well, this could be the basis of a song. Um, and the lyrics came about because all my life and even now, I've always, when I go to sleep, I dream a lot. Sometimes they're good dreams, sometimes they're, they're, you know, they're nightmares. That's just the way I am. I'm, I'm probably nutty. 
Um, so it came about and I thought, well, I'll write a song about my experiences when I'm asleep. So that's how it came about. It's a very simple song, you know, three chords or whatever. Um, the intro came from another song we'd recorded that I'd written when we were Spice. So uh, Dream Mare came about and Ken put some great slide on it and did the harmonies or whatever. But so, so, so Dream Mare was, again, and, and a lot of the, the heap, early heap stuff was, it was two or three songs joined together. So, and that's how it came about. But no, I've always liked Dream Mare. I've always hoped that somebody producing a horror movie would pick up on it and make me a lot of money, but I, I don't have that luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could certainly see it fitting. The, the lyrics create such a, a powerful image, and uh, I'm not a huge lyric guy, but that one has always stuck with me because I think it's a very powerful thing. Yeah, I mean, the lyrics, a lot of people say to me, Christ, Paul, that's a bit dark. And I said, well, I just wrote lyrics down as, 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 as they came out, you know, I... I mean, if you, when you're writing songs, you, you can't... If you sit down and plan to write a song, it won't happen. These things just come out. You can wake up in the middle of the night sometimes and you've got an idea. So, you know, you keep a tape a recorder or whatever by with modern phones now, and you think, oh, I'll put that down before I forget it. Because you wake up in the morning, you've forgotten it. So, um, but no, dream, that's how Dream there came around. It was, it was late at night down in my mum's... Uh, property in Hampshire in the south of England. Um, and it came about and it was written within 20 minutes, I guess. You know. That's, I, I've heard that most of the, the songs that we feel are the best songs are the ones that were just, they just happen very quickly. It's when you yeah. start overthinking them and saying, well, maybe I should do this or maybe I should do that. You're really tearing away at something that's very good. Yeah, well, I, I think as a songwriter, musician, whatever you want to call us, guys, the harder you work, I mean, I've had it in the past when we went with bands with Heat, whatever, you know, we've got to get a new album out. The harder you work to make it, make it happen, it doesn't happen. These things come out whenever they're ready to come out, you know? And the more you try, oh, I've got to sit down and write some songs. They're not going to be good songs. Once you start, start thinking, right, I've got to write six songs for an album. Yeah, you might write six songs, but the but it probably won't be good songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 that's very true. Was it uh, was it that somebody would kind of come up with an idea and then you guys would jam around it and piece it together, or was it more that somebody came up with kind of a basic structure of the song and people just added their parts? No, for for, for most of my time in your eye heap, um, whoever it was, cared by self or whatever, we would come with an idea for a song or lyrics or the chord sequence, whatever. The band always, we, we used to get together, the five of us and the band, and that's what made it work. I mean, July Morning is a great example. It's a song that Ken brought along as a very basic idea, and we tried it many times and just couldn't make it work. So we used to keep putting it on a shelf, and then we were recording that, we were rehearsing down in Covent Garden in London one day, and we said, Oh, we'll have another go at July morning. And I came up with the idea of, because I'd listened to Deep Purple Child in Time, you know, doom, doom, doom. and I came up with the idea of doing like the synth, the, the, the bass notes to, or, or, or on the beginning, whatever. And it suddenly, we all just, between us, we made it into a song. And I mean, for me, for my time in your eye heat, or for any time really, July morning. Is an absolute magic recorded song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree you know? with that. And whenever I do, we used to do gigs with Ken or, or, or Ken and Lee to be on stage somewhere uh, at a festival, or whatever, with the sun shining, whatever, and play July morning was an absolute pleasure. And it, it, it's just, it's one of these things, a bit like. Uh, the Eagles with Hotel California or, or Zeppelin with Stairway to Heaven. It was just a milestone for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I go, yeah, well, when we recorded that and I heard the finished product and I thought, yeah, th this, is, this is good. It's always nice to feel when you hear the work that you've done after it's been mixed and mastered, look, to look back on it and go, I think we have something really special here. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I can still put July morning on today, 50 years later, 
and I think, yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good song. Everybody in the band, band at the time played it just right. And I, I've, I've got to be honest, I've heard it many times over the years by various lineups of your eye heap. For me, um, July morning works as it was originally played. Um, that that's what worked for me, and I do get disappointed sometimes. Not just with Heat, but with many bands. You go to see them, and you want to go and hear your old favourites, and they've suddenly rearranged them, and I feel cheated then. And yeah. I mean, that's why I love Pink Floyd, one of my favourite bands, or the Eagles. You go to see them, and they play the songs as you listen to them at home. Why change a great song? Why rearrange it? I mean, July morning, for, for, for your eye heave over the years, and that's not my dish, is I'm not part of it, has become a vehicle for bass solos. And No, the song, you don't need that with a song like July morning. The song states it. Mm-hmm. It's interesting, too, when people do covers of songs, a lot of times they'll cut out half of the third verse, they'll rearrange it completely. Oh, yeah. And- I, I don't get why you would change the story. No, I mean, I, I don't get this at all. If you choose to, to, to play or record a song uh, by whoever it may be, not he, anybody, you, you, do your, you do your version, but keep it pretty kind of similar to how the song was written because that's how the song was meant to be. If you suddenly start taking it apart, and doing all sorts of different things. Well, don't do that song. Write something else and play that. But maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I don't know. This is just my take on these things. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, in uh, in more recent years, though, you've done some other recordings. You uh, played on some songs on a Twisted Tapestry album. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was some guys. <laughs> we did one of these heat pensions a few years ago in Belgium or somewhere with some some guys I knew, Merrick or whatever. Um, and when I got home, they sent me an email, could, 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 could you p- p- put some bass down on some tracks? And I said, well, send me the tracks over. I said, I, I don't know, I'll do what I can. So they sent the stuff over. And I, I did about three different bass takes and sent it back. And I said, well, I don't know if this is what you want. I said, but this is my take on it. So you can choose from, from the takes. And if you feel it's, it's, it's good enough, then great. You know, if not, just tell me it's crap and I'll, I'll, I'll go away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the challenge when you're not working directly with them. I mean, doing everything remote, you don't get the same feel because you're not playing in the room with them. You don't see. No, I don't. I, and this is, this is how recording has gone over the last few years. I mean, certainly through lockdown and the virus, um, people do things uh, yeah, with with vast amount of distances between them, which is a great way. We all have to reinvent ourselves as musicians to go over this. Um, uh, and even before the virus, people were doing this. But it's not the same as going into a studio and sitting down with four or five guys in the band and playing a song. You don't have the same feel. It's difficult. But you do your best, you know. Well, and, and I think about albums back when uh, bands would record on ADAT and they would just send the ADAT tape from one person to another person to another person. And you don't, when I listen to albums that were recorded that way, I typically don't enjoy the songs. They don't feel like they have a camaraderie. They feel like people... No, no, no. That, the, the, the problem is with this, and I know we've all got to find ways around the problems we have at the moment, but recordings like that, to me, I mean, I don't listen to many because they... Pa- they become disjointed, and I kind of think, okay, we've all got to earn some money, but have a little bit of care about what you're doing, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then you did some recordings on uh, what Chris Rainbow's album, License to Rock. Oh, Chris, yeah. Well, Chris is a guy I bumped into some years ago. He was just doing a gig at a club. And we got talking, and he was telling me about himself. And I said, "Well, I've, you know, I said, well, I'm a bass player, all this sort of stuff." Um, and he said, "Well, I got some songs I want to do an album. Would you fancy playing on it?" And, um, and I've had a lot of this over the years. And I said, "Well, okay, well, send me the songs, um, and we'll see. Well, yeah, we'll have a listen." Um, and to be fair, we, we, uh, we, he sent me some songs, and I thought, "Yeah, this could be so fun." You know, it's. Um, It'd be nice to get in the studio and put some songs down. So 
uh, over the course of 12 months when we were both free, we did it. And the end product, I was very happy with. We did a couple of old heap things. Yeah, he said stick a couple of heap things on. So it was um, an enjoyable experience. It was never going to you know, make, make any money or whatever. But it's nice, just it was kind of for me. I thought, well, it's to let me pe- people, you know, pe- people that know me. I'm doing something actually specific. They can they can listen to it, and so I was very pleased with the end product. And Chris did want to do some more, and he sent me some songs. And I kind of said, well, hang on, Chris, we're just really retracking where we've been. We've done we've done that album. We were both very happy with it. I think it's best left alone because you've got to know when when to stop things. Yeah. I, I, I've never been one to just regurgitate. So many bands they'll, they'll have a good, a good album or a good single, and then the next stuff is just basically a rehash of what's been done, which I find is um, for me that that's no good. Do you think a lot of that is record company pressure? Uh, well, I mean, the thing I did with Chris Rainbow, we, we did it all ourselves. So we, we recorded it, put it out at a, a, a small studio. It went out on Spotify or whatever. So it was a very limited market. It was never going to be a big seller. Um, record companies, I mean, I, you know, I, mean I, I was out of the music business big time for many years. Record companies, managers, agents... I've never had very much time for because they don't think of the artist. They just think about money. So um, I've always I've always loved playing music, but I've never been particularly interested in that side of it. I, I'm happy to go and play music if people like it or want to buy it. Fine, but I, I've never been motivated mot- motivated motivated by egos. Uh, money or whatever i've I've made you know i've I've done stuff all my life i've survived but i've never been motivated but 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 by all the showbiz stuff which is probably why i got fired from your heat because i just like playing music yeah well that that should be the prime motivator i mean it, it depending on what your position or your role is you may have to interact with the business side but if your goal is to just be the musician then then that's what your role is yeah, I mean, I know I, I'm not I'm not sh- stupid. Once you get out there doing stuff, and you're involved with, with with record companies, but it is a business. It has to be viable. But I think you have to be very careful how far you go with that. And once record companies and managers start dictating what you want to do, you need to step back and think. Well, hang on, do I actually want to be getting involved in this? I mean, that's always been my problem, which is why I've never made a million back million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but you but but aren't you happier being in the role that you want to be in? Yeah, I mean I, I was involved in Heap and bands before and after Heap. Um and eventually in the early eighties it got to the point I was struggling to make a living. I wasn't at music in those days. It was going in, into the sort of electronic synthesized music and I thought, hang on. Uh, I'm struggling to get it get a gig here. I think the, this has moved on away from me, and 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 so I I, <laughs> I went into the construction industry where right where I was trained and made a good living for many years, and then it was only I had no contact with anybody from Uri Heap for I don't know thirty years, and it was only for late nineties. John Law, one of the Heap singers, out of the blue, I'd never met John. Phoned me up, said, "Listen." Uh, I've been talking to Ken Hensley. We're all thinking of getting doing a, a heat bench in London. Uh, uh, would you be interested? And I said, "Well, yeah, well, okay. Well, we'll talk about it." And it went from there. But uh, up until twenty years ago, I'd been out in the music business for, for, um, for, 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 for I don't know twenty years. But you know what? the The thing is, is that music itself is timeless, and the things that we put out into the world are there forever. And the yeah. parts that you played in, in, especially, you know, in the late 60s, early 70s, those things are still being enjoyed and they're still finding new audiences all the time. I mean, that stuff is, is stuff that will forever be a very special time in music. Well, yeah, I mean, I was completely amazed. I mean, this is in the days before social media, Facebook, whatever. 
When I got involved with John Lawton and Ken Hensley doing the heat banks in 2000 in London, and I started to delve into this stuff, I was completely amazed how much interest there still was in Uriah Heap and all the old guys like myself. I mean, I'd, I'd just not experienced it. All the, I, I'd been away from it, you know. Um, and I thought, how can these people still remember what I did with the band in 1970? I mean, it was just did my head in. Mm-hmm. And, and subsequently, of course, over the years, I, yeah, I'm on Facebook and all this stuff now, which yeah, a lot of it's a bit iffy. But I've been amazed how how so many people are passionate and uh, there's people come on to me now, they know more about me than, than I do myself. I mean, it's just amazing. And I suddenly thought, well, hang on, this is obviously the great power of music. Yes. Well, I mean, look at Beethoven and, and, and Mozart. People still to this day, uh, you know, are, are discovering them. Beethoven's music is playing on a, on a satellite yeah. in space. I mean, music is, is the one thing that I think will really withstand the test of time. And of course, I mean, if, 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 we, if, if we all just step back a minute, think of how many great artists, how many great composers never actually received any recognition while they were alive. So I count myself lucky that over the last 20 years, I've had a lot of uh, good messages and comments and, and great times with people for the music I've been involved in. So, yeah, how cool is that? No, oh, it's awesome, yeah. Well, Paul, I can't thank you enough for taking some time out and talking to me. I, I really, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of the first three albums of Uriah Heep, especially. And Salisbury's always had a special spot in my heart, as, as has July Morning and Dream Air. Um, you've been a part of some really amazing things that not only were amazing at the time, but they really helped shape the world of music as we see it today. Not so much in the pop structure, but definitely so many bands were influenced and create what they create because of what you guys did back then. Well, I mean, there's very kind words, and, I, and I'm very humbled by that. And I must say, last year, Mickey Box contacted me and said they, that they were doing a show in, in the Czech Republic. Uh, would I like to go over there and do a guest appearance on stage with them, along with John Lawton? So I went up on stage last July and um, played a few songs with them, and we had a great couple of days, me and Mick, just reminiscing, whatever. And so... Yeah, you know, I'm just very thankful for things like that. And Mick and myself, we had no contact for many years. We we talk to each other virtually every day now, especially through this lockdown. So again, it's all the power of music, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for the music, for, for taking some time to talk to me today. It's a real pleasure to connect with you and, and share in some of these memories because they're, I have memories of them that are different from your memories. So it's great to to connect those. Well, of course, we all have everybody, whatever band you're in, but through your eye heap, they've had a lot of changes of personnel uh, from my time in the band. Ken, bless him, David's not here, but, but the rest of the guys, we all have different recollections of what happened in the band, but, but, but uh, 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 through Facebook and all sorts of social websites, that we all get these things back together. I very often have interesting conversations with people. They remember something different as to how, how I remembered it. Because that, we're all humans. That's, you know, no, none of us all remember everything being the same, do we? Right. It'd be a really boring world if we did. Yeah. <laughs> well, you take care, Paul. Stay safe. And yourself. Great talking to you, man. You too, my friend. Take care. And if I'm over in Vegas next year, I'll give you a shout. Oh, please do. I would love that. Yeah. Cheers, my friend. You take care. Bye-bye. You know, the greatest thing for me to get to talk to these guys is not just to be able to say thank you for all the enjoyment, for all I've learned, uh, for everything that they've given us, but just to hear how passionate they still are about music that was created a while ago, to see that, that it still means something to them because it means so much to me. That, I think, is the most heartwarming thing. And uh, kudos to these guys for being pioneers in the industry and creating things that no one was doing. I mean, who did Uriah Heap learn from? Because there was nobody like them before. They created this sound and that style of music. Uh, 
really fascinating stuff. So thank you guys for joining me on another episode of the Haskin Cast podcast. Remember to leave your ratings and reviews. Thank you guys for joining me for another week. We'll see you next week. Cheers. Cheers.